the network at the application layer to um, curb abuse or whatever you consider to be abusive as a carrier, um, to be able to differentiate so that you can sell or offer different tiers of service at different price points, etc. Um, so some examples. Um, the, the, the simplest is just simple statistics by profiling the kind of applications uh, being utilized by the subscriber base. So one of the, the first things people do with our box is put the box in the input for a while and then say, show me the top, the heaviest 5%, uh, say, web users, which typically are people running a successful website at home, which they're not supposed to. Because often the acceptable use policy says, this is a, if you want to run a business, uh, come in as a business customer. But if you're a residential user, we don't want you to run a very successful website at home because it's going to offset all our network planning. Um, you look at the top 5% um, heaviest email users, that's typically your spammers. Um, and we talked about spam a little bit before, before I came up. Um, spam is a very difficult problem, but what we've realized is um, if you can see on your network, for the largest contributors, you can set limits and say, you can send 100 emails a day, you can send 1,000 emails a day, but if you're sending 100,000 emails a day, you're up to something. So let's create some kind of a limit and um, enforce it. And that'll be a service to our users and to the world. Well, what does it mean we see 100,000 emails a day? Uh, yeah. That, that's a different problem. And, <laughs> and, uh, and um, I'm, I'm close to having that problem. Um, but if you control a lot of, a lot of those who send 100,000 emails a day, there'll be less people receiving 100,000 emails a day. And the other angle here is um, there's a lot of those proxy servers. There's a lot of those, um, they call it zombies, pe people's computers who have been hijacked without their knowledge often and now being used. So some carriers that are using our solution actually are using another capability that we have to redirect um, a session on the fly. So um, when those users come on the network, they automatically get redirected to us and saying, um, you're sending too much email or you're sending too much traffic or you, you're probably, without your knowledge, a part of a denial of service scheme. Here's what you have to do to clear your computer and then you'll be allowed back on the network. And it's both a service to those users who are often unaware and a service to the rest of the community because that contributes to a lot of noise. In terms of volume, by the way, uh, email is not that big um, because you get a lot of those uh, purple Viagra emails. Uh, <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's uh, 100 bytes, could be 500 bytes. Um, um, one download of Nemo is 800 megabytes. But the images, yeah, don't they? Yeah, well, the pretty lady that's the same. Right, right. <laughs> so make it uh, 500 bytes. Um, it, 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 it is a lot, from a carrier perspective, on email, they worry less, um, and, and this is true for AOL, for example. Um, by far, spam is a huge, huge cost item for AOL, uh, but it's because of the storage requirements. Um, they end up with so much intermediate storage for junk that they have to keep increasing to keep up, um, which is a killer. So if you can reduce that by a few percentages, immediate return. Peer-to-peer -peer kill, kills the network. Um, and so the per user is, is one angle. Um, this is schematic, but I'll show you some real uh, slides. But what this shows is something that um, people already have. Right? So the routers can tell you how much traffic, and you can track it. And typically, there's, a, there's kind of a pattern. Um, you look at, uh, depends on what kind of a, if, if we take AOL, uh, residential people come home, they get connected, uh, go to sleep, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as it grows, um, you know you're hitting your limit, um, and you'll have to increase capacity. And logically, um, first you want to know what is that traffic made up of. And of course, you can drill in at a great detail, and, and often carriers do, because they not only want to know that a lot of traffic is web, um, they want to know what are the hot sites that drive those traffic. Um, we want to know a lot about their uh, the demographics. Um, from a control perspective, you'd like to be able to say, I want to define limits. And 
here's the limit for email, and everything beyond that limit, we'll color it red, and we'll see what happens. And you can play what ifs, and the goal is to say, I want the red to be gone. So that, again, my link is manageable. And if I'm under the threshold that anybody trying to do anything on my network will get a, a decent response. So this is the theory. Um, here's what it looks like in real life. Um, all this red is peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, 60 to 70 percent of the traffic everywhere we go is peer-to-peer. Um, and we're deployed in almost every geography. I can tell you it's the same. Um, the mix of the peer-to-peer -peer traffic is a little bit different. So there's a lot of Kazan in the United States. Um, e Donkey is probably the biggest in Europe. Um, there's protocols like WinMX and Winnie in Japan, names that you've probably never heard of, but uh, um, deadly. In fact, Winnie is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol which is not only encrypted, it was designed by a combination of um, programmers and lawyers, essentially to create complete plausible deniability. <laughs> it, it's a very interesting protocol. Um, it, it took us a few days to figure it out. But what they've done is to say, um, when you ask me for a file, um, that request goes to me and 10 others, and every one of those 10 others sends it to three more. And so uh, it's hard to trace who was actually being asked for the file. It goes back the same way. Um, it's encrypted, but in any um, station on the way, it gets decrypted and then re-encrypted to send it up. And you may ask why. The reason is if somebody um, gets a warrant and grabs your computer and finds child pornography on it, mm -hmm. um, you could say, I was just a node on this network. Everything is different. But I didn't ask for this file. I didn't know it was there. Mm -hmm. It was en route to somewhere else. Oh my God. There's no way to prove whether um, you were the recipient, you asked for it, you were. Yeah. I call it data laundry. That, that was the guy's defense, and he got data convicted. Laundry, yeah. <laughs> There's uh, been a few of those. By the way, one of those guys got acquitted. Um, oh. One was convicted, but but Winnie mm -hmm. is uh, has made this into an art, and um, I think I have a graph here from Japan, so you'll see. Japan, most of the peer to traffic now is Winnie. Um, hasn't really moved out of Japan yet. I, I'm not sure why, but uh, it'll get there. <laughs> yeah. So, what you're saying is, you know, he's doing uh, very important technology, and if uh, ISP get a hold of, you know, um, yeah, so I'll address this to uh, Shutting down peer-to-peer -peer is not an option, um, and it's not smart. So uh, P2P is one of the reasons why people jump on this uh, broadband bandwagon. So if you're an ISP and you shut it down, that's not going to make you very popular. Um, but you look at the um, stock of preventive about the evolution of P2P. Um, it started with Napster. Um, Napster was about exchanging songs. MP3 files are typically two, three, three megabytes in size. So the usage, usage pattern would be you would search for files you like, you would download them in order to listen to the fairly interactive experience. Um, where we are today, um, the big problem or a lot of the traffic is not the little MP3 songs, it's those full length DVD movies, JPEX. Um, full size application suites, um, games. Um, so average file size, this, a lot of the files, files being um, exchanged are in the neighborhood of between 800 megabytes to 1.5 gigabytes per file. So the interactive aspect of this has gone away. Um, you don't sit next to your computer waiting for Nemo to download. Uh, what, what, what is 1.5 gigabytes? That's just incredible. Um, yeah, you look at you look at a, a full-length DVD. It could be a lot more. Yeah. How, so, how many back times do these people have? I mean, they, they can't store more than what 30, 40 files. Then. Um, so, uh, for yeah, yeah, what they do is download, burn DVDs, and download more. Yeah, download for days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. days. You, yeah. you burn it onto a CD ROM and you down. Actually, you have two computers. You have the computer that you lose to use, and then you have the other computer that's sitting on the router that's connected to your broadband cable modem that's doing all your downloading. That's how you do PPP PP, and use the internet. And at way. home. And I can tell at you, home. a lot of people use it at the enterprise. I love um, oh yeah, oh yeah. On, Which now you got a really big WAN connection. Yeah. So you go home, <laughs> a, a lot of those enterprises, the, the cubicles have become uh, DVD and print shops. Exactly. 
You come in in the morning, a lot is completed. <laughs> you find about I give a test that HP has at least 50 cubicles that are like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what happens when voice over IP starts gaining in popularity? Um, so I'll, I'll show you. Uh, Skype is mentioned here. I don't know if you guys know about Skype. Mm -hmm. um, Zenstorm is the guy that uh, put Kazaa together. Um, and uh, yeah. a couple of months ago, he introduced Skype, which is the same Kazaa type P2P infrastructure to run voice over IP. Right. And um, while it's not groundbreakingly novel, I think, um, he's well, done a good job with it. Yeah, there's there's other there's there's TeamSpeak. There's a whole bunch of others that are out right. there. Now, I, I was going to ask you to address the, the, its quantity, where, where it falls. Does it fall into to P2, um, into peer to peer, or does it does it fall somewhere else? So uh, so um, this graph is August, and Skype wasn't to be found. I have one with Skype, but it's still very very small. And at the same time, yeah. we're we're measuring this on some European networks, and it's doubling every ten days. Whoa. You may want to try uh, also uh, TeamSpeak. Because team, I, I have a TeamSpeak. You know, I, I, I have a TeamSpeak server for me and my buddies because we're you know national. Right. Uh, we don't use a telephone. So, so TeamSpeak, I think, um, is not a pure peer to peer. It's not. No, it's not pure peer to peer. Right. No. right. So there's a bunch of those that exist, and yeah. it's easier to track. But but the trick with Skype is it's completely peer to peer. So there's no server you can look for or monitor or bring a court order to shut down. Right. Um, you can think anybody on the peer-to-peer -peer network and create a direct connection and have a conversation with. And it's not even illegal. There's a lot of copyright discussion over um, content being swapped. Well, right? what about MSN? Um, is MSN, when you start talking to somebody on MSN, is that going through their server or yet? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, so anyway, the, 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 the deal is this, back to the earlier question, um, shutting down peer-to-peer -peer is not something ISPs are going to do, it's not smart. No, there are, there are intelligent ways of handling it. Yeah, and, and if you handle it intelligently, what happens is, uh, since peer-to-peer -peer is not interactive, and the usage pattern is, you got 20 of those downloads going on, um, in the background. It's become a background application. And um, from, from the ISP perspective, it is a nightmare because whenever you build a network, you never plan it or build it for the worst case scenario. You build it for the average case. And you say, even telephony network, you don't assume that everybody in modern view will pick up the phone <laughs> the at time. once mm -hmm. and try to dial. And by the way, if it happens, a lot of those will have a busy count because the mm -hmm. That's what happens with well, an earthquake. Right. Everybody right. calls up. Right. Do you feel like that? <laughs> and um, <laughs> yes, I did. You look at peer to peer. Since it runs in the background, people leave their computers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, connected to a broadband connection. This thing will suck whatever capacity you you make available. However, at the same time, those users, like all the other users in the foreground try to do something else. Um, so they try to browse, they try to play a game, they try to download a video, and they get a really bad experience because the whole network is congested. So what we find out with a lot of those carriers is if you tone it down somewhat, some, everybody's happier, including the P2P um, users. So um, I, I think this is back to, if you manage this intelligently, everybody's happier. Um, P2P users are happier. <laughs> So you recognize you recognize that it's a P2P, and you just say, okay, we're going to capture it this much right, right. per set. But you can do that per session, right? Per session or an aggregate level, um, and I think I have a graphic here that shows this. But okay. um, most of what most carriers want to do initially is this: um, what what is our network up to? Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's some subtlety because um, I think the the light green, yeah, it says P2P on that. 